Welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. My name is Lisa Beyer and I will be your host. In honor of PubCon, which is happening this week virtually, I am interviewing Tony Wright and he is going to share with us all of his social PR secrets when it has to do with reputation management, especially during COVID. What does reputation management have to do with public relations and social media and search marketing? Everything. Reputation management impacts small businesses, personal brands, large corporations, and everything in between. Join me in welcoming Tony and be ready to get some action-packed social PR secrets when it has to do with reputation management, what you can do now and what you can do proactively and what you need to know if you ever get a negative review or get caught into a crisis situation. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. We are talking about a topic that I am very excited to discuss with an expert, Tony Wright, my guest. Hey Tony, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having me, Lisa, I appreciate it. Well, it's PubCon week and I thought, what a better week to have you on, talk about your PubCon session. And if anybody um, is interested in PubCon, just go to pubcon.com. We've both been speakers at the conference for, I think, almost 20 years. I'm yeah, it's say. been a long time. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to, um, to, to share with everybody some of your tips on reputation management, especially reputation management during COVID. Uh, yes. But before we get into it, just tell us a little bit about how did you get into this space and in PR and, and reputation management and what's your, sure. your journey? It has been a, it's been a long, strange journey, as they say. Um, I actually started out my career in journalism as a newspaper reporter, um, working for a number of uh, papers, including a very large paper, the Dallas Morning News, and then running a small town newspaper basically by myself. Uh, I loved that, but I realized rather quickly that uh, supporting a family in journalism, even back then in the 90s, was going to be a little bit difficult. So I went and got my master's degree in advertising, thinking I'll be great advertising creative, but that was right about the time the internet was starting. So I actually did my uh, thesis on on the internet because I was very interested in what was going on there Um, and ended up landing a job at Weber Shandwick, which is the largest, was the largest PR firm in the world, still one of the largest in the world. Um, And my main client was American Airlines. Um, I was doing digital public relations back in the late 90s, uh, which frankly was kind of unheard of. Um, at that time, but um, but I, uh, I was doing SEO for American Airlines, looks a lot different now than it did back then. But um, because American Airlines was my main client, um, 2001 rolled around, I was actually on the crisis team for Weber and American because I was basically the digital guy. And um, I got thrown into the uh, into 9-11. Um, when 9-11 happened, I was, it was no longer wearing just a digital hat, I was managing crisis for the entire airline. I can't even uh, imagine. And, uh, you know, I was a 26 year old, 27 year old kid, didn't really know a whole lot of what I was doing, but I knew kind of how to, to do some of the, you know, manage things and, and get it going. We were able to, you know, be pretty successful with that, uh, keeping the, the crisis from becoming the airlines crisis, obviously it became the nation's crisis as opposed to the airlines crisis. But after that, I kind of, you know, I guess I had skins on the wall. So reputation management became kind of my thing. Um, working, uh, work with cruise lines, uh, I, I, you know, other airlines. I've, I've done, see, I've done crisis on four airline, cr- uh, four airline disasters, um, three cruise ship sinkings, and uh, countless CEO infidelities. But my first love kind of was search. I, I just really loved search and uh, found a way to marry those two when people started worrying about what was showing up in their search engine optimization results. So, um, you know, henceforth now, gosh, I've been doing digital for 21 years and, uh, and owned uh, my agency, right? I started my agency 13 years ago and we do everything, uh, full service digital, but uh, we do a lot of reputation management still. A lot of people still call us for uh, items when they've got a crisis, especially um, that, that is affecting them online or just things showing up online that they don't want to be there. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I got into this. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, 
coming from the public relations lens, I know how important it is from a reputation managed standpoint, how the littlest um, slip up on social media can turn into a PR nightmare or reputation yes. management nightmare. And all of a sudden, you know, your social media team has gotten you in trouble. Um, but reputation management looks a lot different today than it did, you know, 15 years ago because of search. And you don't have to be necessarily a cruise line or an airline to be worried about reputation management. So it's for the yeah, small absolutely. business, you know, the one person, one brand, um, as it is for big corporate America. So what is what is the state of reputation management look like today? And 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 how does COVID factor in? Sure. Uh, reputation management today, it, it really is, you know, there's almost kind of two levels. There's the, you know, the big enterprise level folks that are still you know, utilizing a lot of traditional techniques. I mean, it, for instance, if you're a, you know, Verizon or AT&T, you know, one unhappy customer doesn't really make a difference for you. Whereas if you're, uh, you know, the dry cleaners and you mess something up, uh, all it takes is a couple of bad Google reviews and you can be looking at significant revenue downturn. Um, is, you know, uh, just ask hundreds of restaurants out there from about their Yelp reviews or, you know, how, how those things can affect them. So uh, really kind of our, you know, what we've been working with more and more are small and medium sized businesses who have issues um, where things are either showing up in the searches or their reviews have just tanked and they're getting tons of negative reviews. Sometimes it's even competitors giving them negative reviews. It just depends. Um, you know, it, it really is kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of different tactics than you would use if you, you know, I, I kind of, I allude to this, talk about this in my PubCon presentation. Um, reviews specifically are logarithmic, uh, meaning that if you have five reviews total and three of those reviews are negative, it looks like you're a bad company. Whereas if you have 500 reviews and you still have those three negative reviews, it looks like three people had a bad day. So uh, it's, you know, it's very much about the perception, how you are seen online. Um, you know, we can get into this about how B2B companies are actually far more susceptible and far less likely to utilize any reputation management services. Um, and, and, you know, I see that a lot, uh, a lot going around where B2B companies are just watching their revenues go out the door with just a couple of negative things. Yeah, um, let's, let's talk about that because I think B2B, um, B2B companies can, see, can feel like this isn't really for me. This is just for restaurants. This is just, you know, for, for retail. But um, B2B reputation management and reviews has I, never been more important. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you are providing services to businesses, more and more of these businesses are wanting to know the experiences of others who are, uh, who are utilizing your services. And, you know, if you have a, a say, you know, of say you're selling something that, you know, piece of software that costs 10,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand dollars. And uh, you have some negative, some, some of your users putting negative things out there about your software or even your competitors and you're competing with three other software platforms, you'll lose that bid if people keep finding negative stuff about you. And there, it's, it's amazing to me how many B2B companies don't even think about that and are losing customers left and right because of uh, stuff that's appearing about them online. And there are ways to combat that even beyond, you know, getting, you know, everybody comes in and says, we want you to get rid of this off of that, uh, off of uh, the internet. Well, I'm not a magician. I, I can't get rid of things. Um, in fact, most of the time, what we're doing is we're not necessarily trying to fix a bad reputation, but create a better one. And, uh, and B2B companies are no, are of, are, are no different in that aspect. They really need to work on uh, creating the best reputation they can before a uh, those negative reviews hit. And if those negative reviews hit, then it's sometimes about creating talking points for your salespeople. How do you, how do you address this with current customers and being proactive and say, Hey, you may read some stuff about us online. We wanted to let you know about that before. If, if the customer finds that, on, uh, that stuff online and trust me, if they're about to spend a ton of money on you, they're going to be looking you up. If they find that, you know, you, you, you can lose the sale before you even get your salesperson in the door, so. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, there was a survey done with journalists, I'm sure you've heard of it, where journalists, 100% um, of journalists surveyed said that they either start their research with a Google search or they confirm their source with a Google search. So either way, if somebody, if customers using that same tactic, they 
they already know they're going to go with the company. They know about the company, but they want to be like, hey, let me just do a Google search on this brand name with the word reviews and see what comes up. And, you know, another thing that I feel with my clients too, that it's an education process is that these, these reviews um, show up in page one of search. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, reviews sites, review sites are not just about the map packs or even on their, you know, site, you know, luckily, uh, lately ripoff report, which has been my nemesis for a number of years has stopped showing up in Google for most searches, which has been a blessing, but that actually just made it. So now it's more of a, a real playing field. In my opinion, that you're not having as much of people, people just out there putting out negative reviews and those showing up, but it's, you know, there are legit, legitimate review sites where you need to be monitoring. You need to uh, be uh, encouraging your uh, happy customers to be posting reviews and, and also understanding what their terms of service are when you ask them. You know, you, in some places you can't just ask for a review um, and really managing that whole reviews process because it isn't just about the review sites. It's also about your search engine results page, which, you know, when that's when someone Googles your name or Googles, you know, even Googles your CEO or your key personnel. Um, you know, uh, trust me, people are Googling your salespeople's names, the salespeople's names. And if something's negative is showing up about them, um, whether it's personal or, or business, that can affect a sale as well. Definitely. So what are some strategies and um, tactics that, B2B companies can use and with platforms like Captera, so, or just, you know, ha making sure that you're protecting your page one search results. Sure. Um, the first, the very first thing I suggest to anyone, the very first tactic in our playbook is uh, making sure that we're monitoring uh, what's going on adequately. And that differs for each, for each company, depending on what you need to monitor as a company. There's no one size fits all monitoring tool out there that doesn't cost a million, you know, there are some that actually are pretty good, but uh, most small businesses can't afford the five to $7,000 a month uh, fees that those, those companies charge. So um, even sometimes it's as simple as a Google, as Google alerts, which are free. Um, sometimes you need to get into something, you know, like a Cision or uh, SEM rush. If you're more technically bent has some brand mention, uh, tools that are okay, um, uh, but also realizing that nothing's going to get 100% of the stuff. But what we're looking for is a tool that's going to capture the stuff that matters. You know, 95% of, 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 if you can get 95% of the stuff, the 5% that's out there that you're not getting most likely isn't going to spread and cause you as many problems. So, so we don't need 100% coverage, but we do need adequate coverage to make sure that you understand when somebody is upset, can you go and, uh, and respond to that person and fix the situation before it becomes a crisis. Uh, so monitoring is the very first step that we take. Then uh, we, we look at, at what's going on in each individual uh, channel. So if it's a Yelp issue, if it's a Google reviews issue, if it's an actual SERP issue, the tactics are very different for each one of those, but we do want to uh, very much immediately look at what's going on in a um, in 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 a, in a channel and see how we can respond to that and make sure that it's uh, that that it's fixed. And sometimes the response is to take them offline. Like for instance, one of our clients that we do is a very large psychiatric practice. We manage their reviews. We we uh, we work to to get them more positive reviews. But they because they do psychiatry and they do drug management, um, they have had people coming in drug seeking, trying to get you know specific uh, prescriptions, etc. And uh, one of the things that some of these drug seekers will do is they will threaten if you don't give me this, I'm going to give you a negative review. And we've gotten a few. So in those cases, it's how do we report those to Google and understanding also that Google's not always going to take them down or, or Yelp or anybody is not always going to take them down unless you can prove that that was what happened. And in a lot of cases we can't. So it's more, how do we respond? But then there's also HIPAA issues with them. How do we understand, you know, the privacy laws? And in those cases, sometimes it is just adequate to say, Please, we're sorry that you, that you, that uh, you experienced something or you feel this was negative, never admitting, you know, the guilt there, but 
have them and then put a phone number out there. Nobody ever calls, but that is usually enough to uh, create the perception that the practice is watching and the practice cares. But we have to do that with every single one. We can't just let one go because uh, if we do, then, then that perception that we are uh, monitoring uh, our, our clients and our patients' complaints is, goes away. Yeah, I could see that. And I know we've had clients too that have, um, you know, crazy scenarios happen and we try to report it to Yelp or report it to Google. And even if it's, you know, definitely something that is through just revenge or not accurate, um, it's very difficult to get, to get them taken down. And the response is always the critical part. I'm just curious, um, let's just say there's, um, you know, your competitor, a client's competitor has hundreds of reviews and the client is a little bit late to the game. We've had this happen a few times and, you know, they have just a handful of reviews and um, they're nervous. Like, you know, brands are nervous to do review outreach because they don't want to get the negative reviews, but it's like this vicious cycle. You have to kind of be ready for the negative reviews to get the positive reviews and the negative reviews actually help. Yes. No, I, I, I mean, I always tell, I tell clients and it, they don't always listen, but I, and actually my last search engine journal column was a little bit about this. Uh, uh, if you're concentrating too much on what your competitors are doing and not on what you're doing, then you're doing it wrong. I um, love that. And I don't care how many reviews your competitor has. Um, the, the, your competitor may be cheating and may get, may get in trouble for the reviews they have. Or they may have been in business for, if they've been in business for 10 years and you've been in business for one year, it, they're going to have more reviews than you. And you don't need to play catch up necessarily. You need to work on how do we start our foundation of building our good reviews. And that is, uh, and, and you know, I'm a big fan of a tool. We use a tool called GatherUp. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yep. Uh, big fans of GatherUp. The reason why I'm big fans of GatherUp is because GatherUp is not a trick. It is not a, you know, it's not something that is, you know, uh, there's a couple of places out there where they'll get you fake reviews or they've got people that, you know, have accounts and can give you 10,000 reviews tomorrow. Gather up is a process. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an, it enables a process where you can get your customers to give you positive reviews and you can get those reviews for your own site. You can get those reviews for uh, Google. You can get those reviews even on Yelp, even though we're not supposed to, you know, uh, ask for reviews on Yelp. You can help, uh, move some reviews towards Yelp and at least and gather up also does monitoring, which is kind of a nice little thing. But I, I am a huge fan of, of creating that first step and not trying to jump in there and worry about that. And when clients say they're worried about negative reviews, the question is, if you're worried about negative reviews, do, do we need to take a look at your business practices as opposed to your actual reviews? And sometimes we'll do um, with clients that are nervous about that. We will, with gather up, we'll do internal reviews. We'll just ask for reviews of customers that don't necessarily go on any website just to see what the customers are saying. And then once we get those positive reviews, then we can ask the people that gave the positive reviews to give us a review somewhere else. That does lower the number of reviews we get overall, but you can, it is a good way to start a foundation and also start looking at what are the things that my customers don't like? Why, are, why would they be giving me a negative review? Um, you know, NPS scores are, are really good. If you're not familiar with the NPS score, it's basically asking one question, you know, would you recommend this service to someone else? Um, uh, and how strongly they agree with that from a one to a 10. And, and creating that score, you want people to be able to recommend you. If you have a good NPS score, most likely you're going to have good reviews. And your reviews don't have to be perfect. In fact, if they are perfect um, and you have, you know, more than a few, it kind of looks fishy. Uh, you know, I mean, you, everybody here knows somebody who's never going to give a five-star review to anyone. And, and that's the case online as well. You know, three-star reviews, four-star reviews, Sometimes that is, in that person's mind, that is about as stellar as you're going to get, unless you were just absolute, you know, a five-star review would be somebody who gave them a check for a million dollars, you know, that, and which obviously isn't going to happen. So it's, it, in fact, when I'm looking uh, personally, when I'm looking at, you know, Amazon, I'm looking at reviews on products 
if I see a product that has a thousand reviews and it's five star, I'm very, very skeptical. And I'm in the industry. I know how this stuff works. And I know most likely these guys have manipulated those reviews and the product. If you're, if you're caught manipulating reviews, the perception of your product is it's very hard to recover from that perception because yeah, that seems like a reputation management nightmare. It is. It is yeah. not to cut corners. I mean, it's like black hat SEO or black hat review outreach, right? Oh yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the thing is, if you get caught doing that stuff, the damage to your brand is sometimes unrecoverable. Um, you almost have to go do the full, go on Oprah Mia Culpa type thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we've got new management. The people that did that are no longer here. It's, you know, because mm -hmm. the problem is once you do that, it makes your product look horrible. It makes it look, if they had to go and do these false reviews, then what's going on there? Why, why aren't people giving them the positive reviews? Yeah. And I think also a good message for maybe if you're anyone in the audience is just starting out in digital marketing or public relations or social media, and you have access to, for example, like Fiverr for, you know, outsourcing and you see these, these opportunities that, Hey, you know, get, 10 reviews for X amount, you know, it might seem like an easy win, but it's, it's a false positive. You know, it's something that is going to come back eventually um, to potentially bite you and not it's, you're not, you're going to look like the hero for a day and then you're going to possibly get fired. Right. If you, if you're, if you're looking to, you know, if you're looking to build a brand for the long term, you don't want to do that at all. And if you're doing a pump and dump something that you're going to be out of in six weeks, maybe, but, you know, it, I don't work with people like that. And, and I know you don't either. And, and uh, that, but that's why that, uh, you know, it, when you're doing business with folks uh, to understand what their long-term goals are, uh, you know, even whether you're buying from them or you're, or you're working with them, understanding what their long-term goals is, is important because if they're going to be gone in six weeks, I definitely don't want to buy any products from them. Yeah, definitely. Is there a right and a wrong way to ask for a review? Uh, I think that's a little bit of a gray area as far as how there is a definitely a wrong way. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a true right way because every company is a little bit different and your customers are different. I think that uh, the wrong way is to, is to just send out something kind of demanding a review or even offering um, it, incentives are a little bit of a, of a slippery slope when you start at, you know, you know, give us, I, I mean, I've actually had somebody do this to me recently at um, a, a local, a local store here. They said, here, I'm going to give you a discount on this product. If you'll go give us a, a positive Google review. And I just kind of looked at him. I said, okay, I took the discount, <laughs> but I didn't leave a, a, a Google review. Yeah. But, but the thing is, even doing that when you're asking that can come back to bite you um, because the terms of service of, all of them say no incentivizing. Um, but I think it's sometimes it's okay. We'll do, we'll actually do this to where, you know, we'll say everybody who's given us a Google review in the last six months has entered into a drawing for something. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, like uh, you know, uh, entered into a drawing for a, you know, an Amazon gift card or something, so, you know, something simple like that. That actually is, is okay. And that's incentivizing. Uh, and technically that might even be against the terms of service. It's a gray area. That's not really spelled out there. But uh, except on Yelp, it is definitely against the rules on Yelp. Um, but I, as far as the wrong way to go about it, definitely uh, just sending out shotgun emails to people uh, who have bought your product, um, you know, uh, asking them for reviews without asking them anything about how the, how the service was. Um, either, you know, demanding reviews from people is obviously not something that you want to do. Um, but the right way could be, I mean, for instance, we have a car dealership that we worked with for years and, and on the dealership side, we actually will have for salespeople a, for their best customers, we'll have, we have a, what we call a review portal. And what that review portal is, is it's a URL that a salesperson can give someone that all it does is walk them through how to do a review, you know, because frankly, this particular automobile manufacturer is known for having a bit of an older um, audience. And a lot of them don't even know how to give a review. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we set this up actually kind of as a service. Uh, 
Because a lot of times they they have these you know little old ladies who buy these cars and love their sales guy and say, how can I help you? What can I do to help you out? And this is actually a way, something they can give these people, say, here's how you can help us out. Give a positive review, et cetera. Um, I mean, some things, other things I've seen do wrong is I've seen, I've seen um, someone come in where they have incentivized their sales reps to get reviews. So they will, I, I had this client that came in and he had a, a bucket full of cash to where every time a salesperson would get a review that mentioned their name, you know, it says, Jamie helped me at such and such. Um, he would give him 50 bucks. Well, all of a sudden the reviews looked like the sales reps names instead of the, the company name. And, and it was, you know, pretty obvious there, there was a pattern there. Yeah, actually that my, the hair salon I go to did that. They had this, um, like a competition with the hair hairstylist. And I told them, I said, you know, this doesn't really look good because it's, it looks like you got all these reviews, boom, like in within a one or two or three day period. And it looks like you were doing something, you know, behind the scenes and it's going to come across and as not you've authentic. Got, and you've got reviews mentioning all these different people. Yeah. Which is fine to have, you know, you're going to have some of those, but if all of them do, it really looks manipulated. Definitely, definitely. You know, I actually saw two examples this week from B2C, from retailers. So I went to Williams Sonoma and bought a bunch of stuff. The woman was so helpful, walked out and I like was thinking to myself how attentive and how like helpful I wouldn't have been able to do this without this, without this help. And within like one minute after walking out of the store, I had an email saying, you know, how was Pam today? And, you know, would you, you know, leave, you know, asking me questions, but it was very easy to answer. It was like, I just had a, I didn't have to like go to a site and fill anything out. I just had to answer a couple questions. And then I left a review that probably went on their site. Same thing happened with my yoga studio. I walked out of yoga on Sunday and I got into my car and there was a, you know, Hey, how was your class? Would you give us a review? And I think that opportune time is when it's fresh and I, feel really good in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't actually leave the review, but I thought about it and I might go back and do it, you know? Oh, well, I think, but I think that hitting people right when, uh, you know, it's timing is important. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, I hate to say, you know, things happen. We had a glitch with a client the other day where some stuff, uh, it was a gather up deal. It wasn't gather up's fault. It was uh, actually my client, it was a client fault. They, they uploaded some customers that hadn't that you know were old like six months old um that just hadn't been uploaded someone saw that these hadn't been uploaded thought oh well, I'll, I'll upload them well then all of a sudden they get emails asking for review from six months ago we got calls on that from the, the customers and it just goes to show you though that you can't wait mm -hmm. you know very long to ask for a review from someone um, you need to be, you know, it needs to be a, an email very quickly, not very, you know, not intrusive, not, you know, but Hey, you know, like you said, in the Williams Sonoma, something that's easy for them to fill out or easy to do, even just a, Hey, you know, if you really, you know, even a note that says, Hey, if you, you know, if you're a small business and you don't have a ton of resources, if you have that person's email, which every small business, they never do it, but they need to be collecting email addresses of their customers for a lot of reasons other than reviews management, but mm -hmm you know, get that email, just send them a note. Hey, how was your service? If you were happy, we'd love it. If you'd leave us a review at this place, Google, whatever you need, wherever you are lacking reviews. If you weren't happy, let us know. Definitely. Just a simple text email like that can, can make a huge difference. Something you don't need an agency to do if you're, you know, if you can't afford an agency or you right. can afford the, you know, a, a gather up subscription, which is like a hundred you know, bucks a month or, you know, but you can, everybody can do that. Exactly. And I think just making it, like you said, as easy as possible, like in the airports, when you're walking through the airport and you, you know, come out of the restroom or something, it's like red, green, yellow, you know, how is your service? Yes. You just are a happy face and a, or an unhappy face. You just press one and then move on. At least you're getting that immediate quick feedback. I, and it's one of the reasons I love, you know, going back to that NPS score. I love the NPS score because it's a simple one question, one to 10 I agree or disagree. I would recommend this person or this company. Oh, are you there? there? Yeah, you were just talking about the NPS score. Okay, yes. So I love the NPS score because the NPS score, we, you know, it's a simple one, one question, 10, you know, you 
one to 10, I agree with or I disagree with, I would recommend this person, this company services. And, uh, and that can alone can give you a, a, a huge understanding of how well your customers are liking your service. And it's, it's pretty well respected score. You know, there's been a lot of research done into NPS scores. Um, but, you know, just getting that, then looking at who's given you positive, who's given you negative, if you want to re, uh, reach out again to them to get to ask them for a different, if, if that's for the folks who are especially scared of, you know, really scared that they're going to get negative reviews by doing a, a program, that's a good way to, you know, send this out for a month or two and look at your NPS scores. If they're fine, there's no reason why you should be scared of getting those negative reviews. Definitely. And, and the more, and even if you do, the, if you get five positive reviews for every one negative review and you keep building that up, you're going to be okay. Definitely. And one of the things that we emphasize in a couple of things is that when you do get a negative review, you can't just go into this analysis paralysis and not do anything and just pretend like it didn't happen and not acknowledge it, not, not in some oh, way absolutely. make a comment or take them offline or something. But then the other thing that is, is to get your customer service. If you have a customer service department, they have to be involved in the social customer service and the review outreach. I mean, everybody's kind of got to have the same protocols and notes and, and responses that are crafted for each channel, you know, like emojis and social, you know, work really well. They, you know, they might not be part of the customer service, like telecustomer service, but you know, th there's all these different channels, chat, reviews, social customer service, mm -hmm. regular customer service that, you know, we just, we see this all the time. I know we talk about it all the time, just to get out of the silos and work and collaborate together so that everybody's on the same page. Well, Lisa, have you, and you remember the old crisis books we used to create? Yes. Today? I mean, you know, at American Airlines, we had, uh, we had like seven phone book size books filled with, you know, plans of what happens in specific crisis. And they were kind of useless on 9-11 because the one thing we didn't have was a crisis plan for if we couldn't get people to anywhere in an airplane. And of course, you remember all the airplanes were grounded. But what I'm seeing, what I've seen actually for, for the past few years, um, crisis books are being replaced with workflows. It is all about the workflow now, who's going to be doing what, and what are the types of responses we're going to have. Um, and I, I don't even like having the responses totally pre-written. Uh, some of them maybe, but but uh, having pre-written responses kind of sounds canned, but having a customer service agents that know, hey, this is who's going to respond. These are the types of things we're going to respond to. And here's kind of the tone and how we're going to respond. Allows your people to really, if you're a one person shop, obviously that workflow is very simple. But if you've got a communications department of 20 or 30 people, who's gonna to respond to this stuff? Is it, and even, you know, is it gonna be communications? Is it gonna be customer service? Is it in, and each organization is different, but you do need to sit down and create those workflows. Um, because if you don't, you will get into that analysis paralysis. Who's gonna do this? And, and who's going to make those decisions? And then the last thing you want is your CEO responding to a negative review. They're, and trust me, they will. On their downtime, they go and look up the company. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. They get defensive. And then you've got a nightmare on your hands. Because the minute you get defensive, you've lost. And, yeah. you, and then all of a sudden, you'll have other people. I've seen this happen where CEOs get involved. Then all of a sudden, you have other people start piling in on the thread. And then you've created five pages of content for the search engines that are negative about you to index. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We've had a plastic surgeon client that um, he would, it's kind of like the same as a CEO. He'd get a, a positive or negative review and then want to write this kind of a book um, response. And I would be like, okay, you can write it. Just don't publish it. Send it to <laughs> us, get it out of your system. Let us edit it. Take a couple, you know, key, key phrases and, you know, he, he was able to kind of get it out of the system without publishing. Yeah, and for most people, this gets into, you know, there are times when you do have to respond, but most of the, I'd say 95% of the time still, the way you respond to something that is negative um, is you try to take them offline. If it becomes an issue that is beyond what is going on on that specific channel, then you need to respond in a public channel that's, that you control, like a press release, your website, et cetera. You don't want to get down in the mud, mud with the pigs because you will lose that fight. Yes, definitely. And you mentioned that you do um, 
reputation management for, for CEOs. And, um, you know, I, I just, I'm happy that I would, I never would want to be a publicist for a celebrity because I just don't want to be the one on the front lines of any, you know, <laughs> like crazy things happening. But what the advice that I give all of my CEOs, senior management, C-levels is like, look, like, don't text anything. I mean, any, any email you send, any text you send is, is going to be screenshotted or forwarded. Just expect mm -hmm. that. So don't send anything that you don't want forwarded to the, the media. Because well, that's, a, that's, that's, a good, that's a good point too, because I, I know a lot of people, their first instinct is sometimes, especially when there's something negative out there about them, is to go to their lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, understand what a lawyer's role is versus a publicist's role. Because a lawyer's role is to, is to mitigate the damage that can happen to you if there is litigation. Sometimes when you're mitigating the damage that could happen in litigation, you're actually increasing the damages that can happen to your brand from a communication standpoint. In many cases, the damages that happen to your brand are far more costly than the damages you would, you would incur in litigation. One of the examples I always use is, I like to use on that is United Airlines happened a few years ago when that, uh, that man was drugged down the center aisle of, uh, uh, you know, that, that doctor, he was drugged out of the plane. Well, United wouldn't respond to anything. Their lawyers told them not to because their lawyers were scared about the lawsuit from that guy. Meanwhile, the public relations damage for United right. probably cost them a hundred million dollars, which they're maybe looking at $10 million at the most in a lawsuit and you lose a hundred million dollars in brand, brand equity. It definitely tanked their stock for a few days. It came back, but it tanked their stock for a few days, which was well over the amount of what the litigation would have cost if they had just literally reached out to that guy and said, we're so sorry this happened. Here's some money and publicized that. Yeah. And the lawyers, the lawyers won that because lawyers, they, you know, they think because they passed a bar once in their life, most of them I know don't pass many bars, to be honest. Um, uh, they, they, they think that, you know, people think, well, they're, they're some special, they have some special knowledge of how to handle this. In reality, they, their job is very different. They're trying, and sometimes, you know, our advice, and I always say, listen to the lawyers, but don't let the lawyers be the ones that dictate your communication message because they, they are not, you know, ask them what will happen if we put this out there, understand the consequences and, and you got to take a risk sometimes. But I, you know, I have a fam I have a family full of lawyers. My brother's a lawyer. Uh, I've got, to, you know, a brother-in-law that's a lawyer. I've got tons of lawyers in my family. And I can tell you that they don't have any true special knowledge other than the fact that they can sometimes help you win uh, uh, in a lawsuit. And that's what their job is. And, Definitely. You know, uh just circling back to COVID and reputation management. Yes. So, you know, talk about being in the wrong place or the wrong brand name at the wrong time. Poor Corona beer. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to them when Corona, the, the coronavirus kind of, you know, turned into the pandemic, there was so much miscommunication happening without, you know, they didn't even do anything and they got, they had to have a reputation management plan in place. So that could happen too. Oh yeah, definitely. I actually thought they handled it pretty well. It, I mean, they, they needed to stay silent because it was not their issue. Corona means crown, you know, and that's why, and, and I, and I think that I've, the, the commercials that I've seen lately with them, with Snoop Dogg and stuff, I feel like that they've come out of this okay. But I know that for a little while it did Im impact their sales and they had to be freaking out, but yeah, definitely. they did a pretty good job of, responding when they needed to, but not making a huge deal, you know, not coming out with a huge commercial. We're not the coronavirus type, you know, because that actually, I think, would have uh, cemented their, uh, cemented them with the coronavirus if they had done something like that. So. So what are three takeaways that businesses of all sizes can apply with reputation management during COVID? Sure. Uh, the one thing, the biggest thing is, um, monitoring everything. Um, if, you know, especially right now, some of this, a lot of the stuff we're seeing is, you know, uh, people coming in saying that the staff wasn't wearing masks or, uh, you know, there's, uh, this, this, this place is not say they're not doing, uh, protocols, et cetera. Uh, you need to nip that in the bud pretty well, pretty quickly. If, the, if, if something like that happens, because safety, creating a perception of safety is, 
uh, paramount right now. And you need to be going overboard to do that. So monitoring, seeing if there's anything like that, uh, anybody saying anything like that, et cetera, or God forbid somebody saying, I got COVID from going to this place. Um, you know, you need to kind of nip that in the bud. Um, communicate what you're doing, what your protocols are, et cetera. If a crisis does happen like that where something happens, uh, make sure that you can communicate effectively with those that are affected uh, and that you're cooper you know, obviously cooperating with, with the government. They're going to make you. But the other thing is you need to have a brand message kind of ready to go out there saying, you know, this uh, in our stores, this happened, this is what we're doing to uh, alleviate it, et cetera. Uh, you don't want to create a stry sand effect, but um, that's why the monitoring comes in because I can tell you, I've seen a couple of places where this has happened. Uh, and like, for instance, when the, when the crisis was pretty early um, of a teller at one of the, at, a, at actually my bank down the road um, was uh, infected with COVID. I mean, this is back when, you know, we were looking at two infections in the whole County for, you know, it, it, forever. And, and so uh, all of a sudden people were scared to go to the branch bank and, but what they did, I thought they did a pretty good job and they're not my client, but they shut it down, they cleaned it and they sent out emails to all of their customers saying, this happened, here's what we did, we've cleaned it, we'll be reopening at this point, et cetera. And, uh, and actually my wife, who's very scared of those types of things was okay going back into that bank. That is the type of thing that, that as a small business, you need to be prepared for. How am I going to communicate that Another reason to have your email addresses of your clients. You don't necessarily need to put that out on your website even. Uh, you know, it, it depends on who you are, but, but communicating with the people that matter, who your customers are, um, is important. So if you don't have those lists, kind of maybe start creating them at least something somehow. Um, and then uh, the other thing is just really putting, you know, part of this I always say, it's not about fixing a bad reputation. Fixing a bad reputation is about creating a new one. You can create your new reputation before anything happens. If you're not telling your story and your story needs to include how you are responding as a business to COVID in all aspects of COVID, business downturns, uh, new regulations, et cetera, talking about that uh, early and often and getting your, your story out there. Um, I mean, for instance, and you don't have to put this on your website, even in Google My Business, you can put things out what you're doing. You can, you can put a note on your Google My Business listing about what you're doing for COVID. Have you done that? Most small businesses have not. That doesn't cost you a thing. You know. Yeah, a uh, whole episode here on, about Google My Business. Okay, yeah. And in, and in that, I think, you know, I don't know who you're, who you're, you're talking to on that one, but, uh, or if you've already done it, but definitely, I mean, you can, you can add your responses to uh, to this pandemic in your Google My Business listing. And I would highly recommend doing that no matter what size business you are. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I don't have anybody lined up, so you can make some recommendations after the show and I will interview sure, them. Yeah, there, there's, there's some really good folks out there that can do Google My Business. I, I mean, I think Google My Business is like the best kept secret that needs to be shared across every business that isn't utilizing it. It's just free exposure. It's free PR. Oh yeah, definitely. And there's so much that you can do that most businesses don't do. Yes. Like for instance, the notes, pick, you know, adding your own images, um, you know, uh, responding to questions, putting out frequently asked, putting your frequently asked questions in, which with those frequently asked questions, guess what you can do? You can add keywords in there. So when people are, it helps you show up in the maps when people are searching for you. Um, it, it is a very powerful tool for small businesses and one that most small businesses just get intimidated by and don't utilize all of the, uh, the aspects that are there. Yeah. I don't know if they, they don't, they're intimidated or they just don't even understand the value of a little bit of time it would take Fair. to, yeah. to just keep it up once a week, spend an hour or two a week mm -hmm. on it or, or less and, and see what the, the results would be. Absolutely. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any resources that you want to recommend? You mentioned one tool, um, Gather Up. Um, what else is there that small businesses could take advantage of? You said Google Alerts. Google Alerts. Uh, Gather Up is a really good one. Um, uh, 
if you are worried about your search engine results, particularly, um, we use we use advanced web rankings because of some of the the ranking tools that they have for tracking negative stuff, how it's moving. Say, for instance, you had something on the third page, you wanted to make sure it doesn't move up to the first page. You can set that up to where it tracks that ranking if it's going to move up. Uh, you know, if, if say it moves up to the second page, you might want to do something about it, etc. So advanced web rankings is a great tool for that. Um, and, you know, there are tons of monitoring tools out there, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, the ones that uh, we use, uh, we, we do use SEM Rush. Uh, we use Cision as well. Um, I mean, there are, and there are lots of them out there, but those are the two that we use mainly. Uh, Cision is more enterprise level. SEM rush is more just a little bit beyond uh, Google alerts. So, okay, awesome. So, if um, somebody wants to reach out to you, find you, where, where, what's the best URL? What are the best social channels? Sure. Uh, my my uh, company's URL is uh, writeimc.com. That's W R I G H T, and then I M C is an Internet Marketing Consulting dot com. Um, you can reach us there. Uh, my uh, Twitter is at Tony N. Wright, as in N is Nathan, my middle name, Tony N. Wright, at Tony N. Wright. It's, I'm real easy to find there. And frankly, if you just go and type in Tony Wright search into Google, you'll find a ton of places where I am. My LinkedIn is, you know, Tony N. Wright as well, um, you know, LinkedIn.com slash N slash Tony N. Wright. Any channel, if you want to talk to me, um, just shoot me a note and I will respond. I'm, I'm multi-channel. Uh, so great. Any virtual events? So we'll, we can catch up with you at PubCon this week. PubCon? Any other events? Um, I will be doing state of search, which is later on this month, which is the Dallas. Um, I believe that's actually early November. That is, uh, and that's uh, going to be virtual as well. And uh, frankly, I haven't, booked many more beyond that because I'm just kind of I'm hoping that we can get back traveling soon uh, yes. the virtual events I don't get quite as much out of but obviously had to do PubCon because I've been yes. doing PubCons forever and and PubCon happens every year multiple times a year so if you miss this week mm -hmm. you can always catch up on the next one sure one and, my, and my session is Wednesday at uh 3 15 central time so okay awesome if you missed Tony's session or you're listening to this episode after PubCon, you can also check out the Facebook group, um, PubCon's Facebook group, and just get into the conversation, join the community there. Lots to learn, lots to share. Tony, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate you bringing me on. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Social PR Secrets. If you like what you heard, check out the book on Amazon or follow our blog at socialprsecrets.com. This episode was sponsored by The Buyer Group, a social PR agency striving to keep our balance in the digital world, practicing public relations, social media, and search marketing, while occasionally drinking a glass of wine or two for the best creativity and results. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to get a free chapter of Social PR Secrets, go to socialprsecrets.com slash free.